offices, intoxicated by the heady scent of wealth and power. With a smirk of satisfaction, he turned his attention to the king's wives, their beauty, a tempting prize for the victorious conqueror. He graced himself with the presence of the two beautiful women. Having his fill till late into the night, he gave himself totally to ecstasy and pleasure. Long, long ago, in the vast and lush kingdom of Omocha, the land flourished under the rule of King Okonkwo and his beloved queen, Adanne. Despite their wealth and power, their hearts ached for the cry of a baby in the palace halls. For years, they had prayed to the gods for a child to inherit the throne, but their prayers remained unanswered. They consulted with every physician that was present within their kingdom and neighboring kingdoms, but no result was forthcoming. At night, the queen cried herself to sleep and was consoled by her husband, the king, who was hopeful that the tides would change in their favor soon. Tongues were beginning to wag within the village and even within the palace walls. The elders started putting pressure on the king to take another wife. However, in the 20th year of the king's reign, the gods decided to smile on them. In the fourth month of the year, that the queen fell sick and was attended to by the royal herbalist. She screamed with excitement as she announced to the royal palace that the queen was with a child. Excitement and jubilation rocked the entire palace walls with the king's countenance totally changed. As her month drew closer, the king was visited by the mouthpiece of the gods who complained that he had been receiving some negative signals from the oracle over the past few days but needed to wait for confirmations before he discloses the news. When Queen Adanne's due time came, she gave birth to a healthy son during a stormy rainy day in the village. And the entire palace celebrated for the blessing. It was a dark night, so the baby wasn't properly observed by the queen and king. The storm lasted throughout the night so the chief priest could not come over to welcome the new heir to the throne. As the new day broke with sunlight shining upon the blessed royal palace, a closer look on the new child by the king and queen brought their eyes to a strange birthmark on the back of the newborn. Three dotted birthmarks at the center of his back. The king and queen didn't read much meaning into it, but decided to keep the child clothed to conceal the birthmark. The excitement continued within the palace. Nevertheless, the king named his newborn Prince Igodo. But the celebrations came to a halt that evening when the chief priest, Baba Okoro, arrived at the palace with a grave revelation. Without having seen the newborn child, Okoro spoke of an ancient prophecy that the gods had given him clarity during the storm of the previous night in a night vision. The prophecy was a grim one, foretelling the birth of a prince who would bring both great joy and sorrow to the kingdom. He announced that the child was destined to cause pain to his parents. The king permitted the chief priest to speak freely what it was he meant. According to the prophecy, Okoro declared, the new prince would one day lay with his own mother after he had brought about the demise of his father, the king. The king burst into laughter. Is this a joke? You mean my son? Is the prince you saw in your vision that will kill me 
and sleep with my wife, Adane? Okoro simply responded, My king, I am only the mouthpiece of the gods, and this is what was revealed to me. Go and tell the gods that they can go back to their long slumber, the king declared in a mocking manner. I had to wait for 20 seasons of their silence. The king got up to walk out on Okoro and other elders present. Wait, my king, does your newborn son have three strange birthmarks at the center of his back or not? Fear gripped Okonkwo and Adane's hearts as they grappled with the ominous words. They had not revealed anything about the birthmarks to any soul, not even the midwife that helped the queen deliver the baby saw the strange marks. Determined to thwart fate's cruel design, they spared no expense in shielding their unborn child from the prophecy's grasp. They consulted with sages, performed elaborate rituals, and even considered abandoning the throne altogether. Yet, as the days passed into weeks, after the child's birth, Okonkwo realized that nothing could change the prophecy. Desperation clouded Okonkwo's judgment, and in a final resolution, with a heavy heart, Okonkwo ordered his most trusted soldier, Ibubedike, to carry out the unthinkable, the execution of his own flesh and blood. The palace guard was tasked with taking the infant to the dreaded evil forest where death awaited him. As they ventured deeper into the dark and foreboding woods, Ebube's resolve wavered with each step. He could feel the innocence radiating from the young prince and doubt gnawed at his soul. When they reached the clearing, where Igodo was to meet his end, Ebube's gaze locked with the child's. And in that fleeting moment, he saw not a threat, but a beacon of hope and compassion enveloped his heart. I cannot do this, he told himself. I would rather leave the child here to his own fate. Unable to carry out the king's command, Ebube made a split-second decision that would defy fate itself. He left Igodo in the heart of the evil forest, trusting in the evil in the forest to carry out the evil deeds themselves and kill the child. To deceive the king, he slaughtered a nearby goat and stained his blade with its blood. A hideous charade to conceal his act of defiance. As Ebube returned to the palace with a heavy heart, he assumed that his actions would not really have consequences as there was no way the little infant could survive the night in such an evil place. Little did he know the threads of destiny had already begun to unravel, setting into motion a chain of events that would challenge the very fabric of their kingdom. Meanwhile, back in the heart of the evil forest, the infant, Igodo's faith, took an unexpected turn. The baby, out of lack of comfort and what to eat, cried loudly, and his cries pierced through the forest and was heard by an old hunter who had ventured into these parts of the forest for his late night catch. The weathered hunter from the distant land of Umede, his eyes sharp and his heart heavy with solitude, followed the cries of the baby. The hunter wondered what sort of evil spirit could mimic the sound of a baby 
he hid behind one of the trees and observed the small cloth placed beside a tree in the middle of the forest from where the sound emanated. The hunter, observant, looked from his hideout to see three vicious wolves circling the piece of cloth. By this, he confirmed that truly there was a baby in it. He stringed his arrow and with a clean shot, took down one of the wolves. The remaining two took to their heels and ran into the forest. Then the hunter went closer and to his shock, he found the baby wrapped in clothes. His heart stared with compassion as he beheld the innocence that radiated from the boy's weary form. Without hesitation, he scooped up the child and carried him away from the forest's grasp, determined to give him a second chance at life. In his humble dwelling on the outskirts of Umwede, the hunter became a father to the orphaned prince, nurturing him with love and guidance. He taught Igodo the ways of the wilderness, instilling in him the virtues of courage, resilience, and compassion. Under the hunter's watchful gaze, Igodo grew up into a strong and capable young boy. His spirit, unbroken despite the trials that had befallen him. But even in the warmth of his new home, Igodo could not escape the sting of loneliness as he ventured into the nearby village eager to forge connections with his peers. The children, ignorant of his royal lineage, taunted him as an outsider and a stranger. Their cruel words cut him deep into his tender heart, heart heavy with sorrow. Igodo sought solace in the comforting embrace of his adoptive father. With tears glistening in his eyes, he confided in the old hunter, pouring out his fears and frustrations. In that moment of vulnerability, the hunter imparted a valuable lesson upon his young ward, the importance of strength, both in body and in spirit. Determined to make him independent and able to protect himself, the hunter had him join the King's Guard training program in the village honing his skills under the tutelage of the kingdom's finest warriors. His determination and prowess soon caught the eye of the king himself, who recognized in Igodo a rare talent and boundless potential. At the age of 17, Igodo joined the ranks of the king's guards. With each passing day, he pushed himself to the limits of his abilities. And by his 25th year, he had risen to become the finest swordsman in all the kingdom. His name whispered in awe and reverence by friends and foe alike. In those days, after a land dispute, war broke out between Umwacha and Umwede kingdoms. As the drums of war thundered across the horizon, Igodo took his place to fight beside the king of Umwede against Umwacha. As the customs of war were in those days, the kings stepped out of their company to try and have a final common ground to avert the impending bloodshed. But they couldn't reach an understanding as both kings flared up in anger and hurled insults at one another. They went back to their various sides and gave the order for battle. The clash of steel and the cries of the falling echoed through the air as the armies of Omocha and Igodo's newfound kingdom, Umwede, clashed in a brutal dance of death and destruction. With every swing of his blade, Igodo fought with a ferocity born of desperation, his muscles rippling with the strain of battle against the backdrop of chaos and carnage. Igodo ensured the safety of the king of Umwede against enemy forces. 
unknown to him, he stood at war with his own father, the king of Omocha. As the battle reached its zenith, the king of Omwede received a serious injury that left him incapacitated. Igodo, helping the injured king to a safe rallying point, promised him to ensure the demise of his enemy. With his promise, he launched into battle again in anger for his injured king and without hesitation, he went for the king of Umwacha. Not too long, Igodo found himself face to face with the fiercest champion of the enemy's army, King Okonkwo himself. With a primal roar, he leaped into the fray, his sword flashing like lightning as he danced through the melee with unmatched grace and precision. The universe in its cruelty now aligned Igodo and his father in the path of fulfilling the first part of the dreaded prophecy. Being a young blood, Igodo gained an upper hand in the one-on-one -on -one combat with the king Okonkwo and in one fierce blow he sniffed life from the aged king, his lifeblood staining the earth as his reign came to a sudden and violent end. And for some reason, Igodo had a different sensation, unlike something he had ever felt before. With the king dead, Umocha warriors seized the attack and surrendered to the king and army of Umwede. Igodo was honored by the victorious king. In appreciation, the king gave a decree, hereby handing over to Igodo the power of the king's loot as a sign of appreciation for his devotion and courage to defeat his enemy. This is a decree that allows the victor of war, which normally is the king or whomever he chooses, to claim everything that belongs to the defeated king in battle which includes his wives and entire household as the victor wishes. With this new charge, pride beamed through Igodo's face. At the first light of dawn, painted the sky in hues of gold and crimson, Igodo rode triumphantly through the gates of the palace. Behind him, his loyal men marched in silent procession, their faces etched with a mixture of awe and reverence for their fearless leader. As Igodo dismounted from his steed and strode purposefully towards the palace gates, he was met with a scene of quiet anticipation. The royal household, clad in their finest attire, stood arrayed before him. Among them stood the king's two wives, their beauty as dazzling as the morning sun. Something about them stirred a faint memory within Igodo's mind. A fleeting sense of familiarity that he quickly dismissed in the heat of the moment. With a sense of entitlement, befitting a king, he declared his intent to seize all that had belonged to the late ruler, including his two beautiful wives. This being the tradition of those days, the royal household bowed their heads in silent acquiescence, their fate sealed by the laws of war and conquest. Without a moment's hesitation, Igodo made his way to the late king's chambers, eager to indulge in the spoils of his hard-won victory. As night descended upon the palace, Igodo revealed in the opulence that surrounded him, his senses intoxicated by the heady scent of wealth and power. With a smirk of satisfaction, he turned his attention to the king's wives, their beauty, a tempting prize for the victorious conqueror. He graced himself with the presence of the two beautiful women. Having his fill till late into the night, he gave himself totally to ecstasy and pleasure. But as the first light of dawn broke upon the horizon, 
heralding the dawn of a new day. Igodo's revelry was abruptly interrupted by the arrival of an unexpected guest. The chief priest of Omocha stormed the royal palace and stood before Igodo with a mantle of authority clutched in his trembling hands. His eyes wide with shock and disbelief as he stared into the familiar eyes. With a voice filled with reverence and awe, he proclaimed Igodo as the long-lost child of the late king, his words echoing through the chamber like a thunderclap. In stunned silence, Igodo listened as the chief priest recounted the prophecy that had haunted his dreams for so many years. The truth of his lineage laid bare for all to see. Igodo ordered his men to seize Chief Priest Okoro and ensure they beat him till his early morning alcohol was cleared off his eyes. But just as they lifted the old slag off the ground and about to turn, he screamed at the king, Open your garment. Let us confirm the three birth marks on the center of your back. With this, the priest gently brushed aside the garment of Igodo's back, revealing three birth marks hidden beneath the fabric. The weight of destiny descended upon him like a mantle of lead. Adani's scream cut through the entire palace as she screamed in disbelief and shock. With a heavy heart and a sense of overwhelming disbelief, Igodo gazed upon the mark that branded him as the chosen one, the instrument of fate's cruel design. And as the truth of his identity sank in, he knew that his journey was far from over. For the gods had indeed gone mad and their whims would shape the course of his destiny for all eternity.